Good morning, everyone. And thank you so and thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. The challenges of our time, the twin challenges, climate change and racial inequity, brought into stark relief by the pandemic, have made clear that companies need to develop business strategies that encompass more than just increasing shareholder value. Today, we'll be getting an overview of how investors can invest in ways that rise to the demands of our time, investing in companies that hone their competitive edge, while also positioning themselves, their customers, their suppliers and their communities for success in an unpredictable future. Next slide. My name is Alice. I'm the Managing Director of the Intentional Endowments Network. I'm going to just go over a few logistics before handing it over to today's moderator, Kevin O'Connell with TIF Investment Management. First, participants in the webinar are muted but you can ask questions or add comments and observations at any time using the Q&A function or through the chat box. If you would like your comments to be broadcast to everyone, then please select all panelists and participants as the chat recipient before sending your comment. This webinar is being recorded and it'll be distributed to all participants by email. It will also be available on our website so you can refer back to this conversation. Next slide. So very briefly, before we dive in, for anyone who's new to the Intentional Endowments Network, we are a nonprofit collaborative peer learning network where endowments and experts come together to advance the field of investing for an equitable, low carbon and regenerative economy. We do this through forums and events, peer networking, sharing useful resources on sustainable investment opportunities like we're doing today, and providing educational venues like this webinar. You can become a network member as an asset owner, an asset manager, or other stakeholder to keep growing this movement, or you can join us for future programming that is open to non-members. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Kevin O'Connell to introduce us to today's experts and lead this conversation. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, and I'm going to uh, just quickly try to put up uh, our slides here. Excellent, hopefully everyone uh, can hear me. Whoopsie daisy. Um, uh, my name is Kevin O'Connell, as Alice noted, I'm an outreach director at TIFF. I help look after our client relationships or as we refer to them as members. Uh, with me today is my colleague, Chris Martini, who is part of TIFF's investment team. He also oversees our efforts in sustainable investing. And uh, he and I are both thrilled to have one of our members uh, as represented by Esther Benjamin, the Chief Executive Officer of World Education Services uh, to join us for this discussion and, uh, and speak a little bit about our partnership. Our bio, uh, biographical information is located in the back of this presentation um, for reference, but maybe I'd invite Esther and Chris just to say a quick hello and introduce themselves briefly. Esther, could you go first? Sure. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, I am CEO of uh, World Education Services, and um, I've spent my 25-plus year career uh, ac working across sectors in uh, international business with uh, governments, uh, specifically focusing on foreign policy, and with international organizations. And uh, uh, my international career has taken me to um, over 110 countries. And uh, most recently, I was with uh, Laureate Education, the world's largest higher education organization, before coming to WES. Uh, so uh, about the past decade uh, working in higher ed. And it's a pleasure to join you today. Thank you for that. Hi. Oh, hi, Chris. Yeah, so my name's Chris Mattini. I work for TIFF. I've been there for about six plus years. I've spent 15 years as an institutional investor in various capacities for TIFF, prior to TIFF at a consultant, NEPC, prior to that at a corporate pension fund. So about 15 years in manager selection and the last several, spending a lot of my time on sustainable investments. I received an MBA in sustainability and have 
the FSA credential, the Sustainability Accounting Standard Board's Fundamentals of Sustainability Accounting credential. A lot of acronyms in this world of ESG, <laughs> um, but passionate about the space and excited to share um, some information with everyone today. And just want to thank IEN and Esther and everyone um, on the webinar for attending. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so I, I would, uh, and I would echo, echo that, uh, really appreciate IEN giving us this opportunity and for Chris and, and Esther joining us. They certainly, uh, as you can tell just by their backgrounds, have a great deal of experience and, and I'm hopefully uh, insightful for you all. Um, we understand that these events are intended to be educational in nature. So really the way the process is gonna work, we're, we're prepared to walk you through a few slides that speak to our respective organizations, the initiatives that we're working on and then as well as uh, discuss our, our partnership, uh, as it were. There, as Alice noted, there's Q &A, a Q and a function, so feel free to make use of that. We'll leave time at the end uh, for Q&A. Uh, on page three, we included a brief synopsis of TIF's history. Um, TIF is an acronym, the Investment Fund for Foundations. We are not TIAA CREF, it's a totally different organization. Uh, TIF was founded back in the <coughs> excuse me early 90s originally set up to help specifically private foundations. Um, fast forward to today, we serve nonprofits more broadly. It's uh, college and university endowments, it's public charities, it's art museums, uh, community foundations, and the like. Uh, in, in aggregate, we manage a little less than seven billion in assets. Uh, and we serve as an outsourced chief investment office or officer. Uh, OCIO, which, which in effect means that the nonprofit institution or nonprofit investor has delegated to TIF the discretion or management of their, of their capital. Um, so we've been doing this for nearly 30 years, um, and we have a variety of portfolio approaches that we use when we work with our, our members. Um, I should note, as it relates to uh, the managing those portfolios, the consideration for environmental social and governance issues pervades all of our investment research uh, as, it, as is included with uh, risk and opportunity and valuation and so forth. Uh, but a couple of those portfolios actually take that a bit further, uh, meaning the, the ESG lens um, and have a deliberate focus on sustainability. And, and that's what we'll talk about as part of our partnership uh, with Wes. Um, we do think of ourselves as pioneers as, as, as we went back to the early 90s, I think we'll hopefully we'll be considered pioneers as we embark on this a new initiative and, and consideration for sustainability investing. The other thing I would add uh, as it relates to TIF is that we ourselves are a nonprofit. Uh, so uh, we, are, we have no equity holders. We exist solely for the purposes of helping our nonprofit members achieve their investment objectives. Uh, and I, I, final thing to note is that we are, are, are governed by a wonderful board of directors that represent chief executive officers, or I should say chief investment officers and, and executives from some of the, the, the globe's foremost foundation and endowment offices. So uh, really proud of our history, have a really unique legacy and um, have a wonderful membership as you'll, as you'll learn and hear directly from Esther herself when she talks about Wes. On page four is just a, a bit more on that, that membership. You can see the different uh, nonprofit segments on the right in the pie chart. And uh, of course, these are all US-based institutions um, at the moment. But we're not here to talk ex explicitly about TIF or, or just about TIF, uh, but hopefully this gives you a feel for who we are and who we serve. Uh, we're here today to talk about sust sustainable investing in a time of change. And, and as I said, or, or uh, tried to make the point, our mission, is the same as it was from day one, which is to deliver investment excellence for nonprofit investors. That has not changed. Um, however, we, we do think that it's more and more important to think about the impact of each of our investment dollars and the values that can be reflected within a portfolio. Um, so we look forward to talking to you about what we've learned in our process, how that comes to be. Totally acknowledging there are a, a variety of definitions of sustainable investing. In TIFF's vernacular, it, um, it really means prioritizing environmental and social impact when making investment decisions. Uh, so really what we're trying to do is, is maximize where we can positive environmental and social outcomes while still meeting those portfolio or investment objectives uh, and risk and return goals. Simple to say, 
harder to do. Um, and there's a great deal of change occurring in today's world that only exacerbates, I think, uh, the challenge, but, but also um, equally perhaps the, the opportunity. There are no perfect answers. Uh, and as we've described it uh, in the past, this is, this is a journey. So today's uh, webinar will be a discussion of where we're at in, in that journey. Um, I, in a minute now, I'm going to turn it over to Esther, and I'll, I'll just sort of mention that Wes uh, more recently has been part of that journey. Uh, we've been managing money for, for Wes for a couple of years now, um, but in the last uh, six to 12 months, have really embarked uh, on taking that next step uh, as it relates to sustainable investing. Um, but she will tell you more about her organization and the social enterprise that is World Education Services, and I think you'll be fascinated to hear and learn more. So Esther, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to join you today. And um, it's great to partner with TIFF and um, uh, have a chance to talk to colleagues within the um, IEN network. Um, so great to be here. Uh, this summer, as I watched young people protest, I was taken back to my own teenage years uh, in the late 80s when I was protesting about investment in South Africa. And this was towards the end of the apartheid uh, regime before democracy was ushered in. I was proud to watch the young people today and um, encouraged my own children who are themselves activists. And um, as I uh, share our story today, um, I remember uh, that moment, and I remember um, that moment in the context of the resources of the organization that I help lead today, and the power of being able to activate social change uh, through how we make investment decisions. We are fortunate to be a social enterprise in, in a position where we can speak to our investments and um, that's what I'm gonna talk to you about today. So WES is truly, truly a fascinating organization. We advance global mobility and we help integrate people into educational and employment situations and we do this specifically by carrying out a foreign credential evaluation. So anyone who is an immigrant or an inter international student or a refugee looking to come to the United States or perhaps even already in the United States um, and or Canada, we help to verify foreign educational qualifications and we also determine the equivalency of the foreign qualification for the US or Canadian context. So we enable international students, immigrants and refugees to gain the most of their foreign qualifications in the new country and community that they find themselves. It's an old organization founded in 1974 I was fortunate to become CEO in 2019, but long before my arrival, this organization was built um, slowly and methodically and brilliantly. My predecessor, Miriam Asefa, was CEO for 38 years. So as you can imagine, uh, as I was uh, being considered for the role, the board thought very carefully about what the next chapter of WES would be. So founded in 1974, we started with working with just 20,000 people. By 1984, 10 years later, we completed evaluations for about 5,000 people. By 2013, things were starting to change. And at that point, we served about 70,000 people. Fast forward to 2019, we completed evaluations for 408,000 people and 485,000, nearly half a million people sought our services. This was phenomenal. It was a phenomenal moment. And now we continue building towards 2024 when we'll celebrate our 50th anniversary. So over this interesting history of nearly five decades, 
we have partnered with 40,000 universities. We have worked with 23,000 different qualifications. We've worked with about 4,000 different grading scales. And we've worked with individuals who gained their education in 203 countries and territories. Our database, as you'll see in our timeline, which was launched in 1998, and we're gonna put this in the cloud in the, in the next 18 months. This database is the most extensive database of higher education qualifications anywhere in the world. So that's who we are. Go to the next slide, please. So over the 46 years of Wes's evolution, there's been an evolution in the type of organization we are. Revenues grew, the work grew, the partnerships around the world grew, and we have increasingly shifted to seeing ourselves and others seeing us as a social enterprise. So as you can see, and you all know this, a nonprofit is, is focused on its mission. It operates with support from donors, all kinds of donors. And the donors often say, this is how we want our money spent. And a typical nonprofit is not generating revenue by providing products and services. You all know very well commercial enterprises that are maximizing profits, that are uh, receiving money for products and services. We operate somewhere in between the world of nonprofits and businesses. And that place is what we call a social enterprise. We are in essence a business and we're equally focused on social impact goals. And we see the business and the social impact goals as going hand in hand. We provide products and services that benefit society and our target population. And interestingly, if there are surpluses, and there are very few social enterprises that are generating, generating the type of surpluses that Wes is generating, well, if those surpluses exist in a social enterprise, they are reinvested into social impact programs. So when I arrived at Wes, almost 18 months ago, I said, wow, this is a social enterprise. And that struck a chord. It struck a chord with the board, with the staff. And uh, I began to position Wes more and more as a social enterprise. Well, we weren't the only ones seeing ourselves as a social enterprise. So did the Stanford Social Innovation Review last fall said that the most innovative nonprofits seek to leverage commercialization for social good. And they singled out Wes and said, Wes offers a credential evaluation service for a modest fee. In return, immigrants and international students receive a credential evaluation. And Wes has found a way to generate revenues while meeting the needs of its target community. So we're not the only ones that see the organization as a social enterprise. Next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of our success and our service in 2019. Increasingly, those who come to us are coming to us with an intent to immigrate to Canada. So these numbers are actually the uh, individuals that came and sought out our services last year. 94,000 were trying to go to school or immigrate to the U.S. or to uh, seek licensing from a professional body. So um, the, the people who receive our reports are universities, licensing bodies, uh, post-secondary institutions, and sometimes employers. So 94,000 people came to us in relation to the U.S. and close to 400,000 with an intent to immigrate to Canada. And those who came to us in the U.S., nearly 50% of them are already in the United States and finding themselves in a place where there isn't 
the value for their foreign credentials that there should be. So they come to us to validate and amplify the value of their foreign earned credential. In the case of Canada, 75% of our Canadian customers are looking to become landed immigrants on a skilled immigrant basis in Canada. Canada has a very progressive immigration policy, which is aimed at attracting skilled labor from around the world. So this was the profile of our business last year. Next slide, please. So these are the top countries of education for those who come to us. Interestingly, this list of countries represents about 60 to 70% of the customers we're serving. And also it is interesting to note that India is um, growing as our number one customer. 30% of our customers are now um, coming to us from India, and many of them are already resident in the U.S. and Canada, but 30% of the credentials we're evaluating are Indian qualifications. So this is the list of countries that is sort of the top serving countries. However, we continue to evaluate reports from nearly every country in the world. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, we have uh, looked at credentials from 203 countries and territories over 46 years. Next slide, please. So we have really grown. We have um, had unprecedented growth from 2013. And uh, these are numbers that are public and on our 990s filed with the IRS. And as you can see, the number of people we served grew from about 106,000 to 485,000 in 2019. That's a CAGR of 29%. Pretty impressive growth. Our consolidated revenues uh, between U.S. and Canadian revenues also grew from 27 million in 2013 to 93 million in 2019 with a CAGR of 23 percent. I'll add a few other metrics. Our margins are above 31 percent, so a pretty efficient business. Our surpluses were 8 million in 2013 but our annual surpluses grew to about 29 million in 2019. So that added to our reserves. Our reserves in 2013 were 17 million. And by 2019, our reserves grew to 146 million. So tremendous growth in our business, in our volumes, in our surpluses, and in our reserves. And with that growth, we started to think about how we should invest these resources in a responsible way. Next slide, please. So what do we do with our reserves? We're doing a couple of things with our reserves. This is part one of what we do with our reserves. We initiated about eight to nine years ago a social impact part of the organization. So it's great that we develop this credential evaluation report, but what do people do with that? Who knows about it? Well, we built recognition of our reports over 40 plus years, and we are now funding social impact programs, including programs that directly serve immigrants, we build the capacity of institutions to serve immigrants, refugees, and international students. And we're also advocating for syst systemic change. We are a convener as well. We brought together a coalition of partners through something we called the Imprint Coalition, the Immigrant Professional Integration Network that we called the Imprint Network. We have a program called the Skilled Immigrant Integration Program. We work with offices of new Americans around the country. 
we work with internationally educated health professionals. All of this we fund through the reserves that we have built up over the past several years. Next slide, please. This is also something we do with our reserves. We have become the only philanthropic initiative in North America focused exclusively on economic inclusion and mobility for immigrants and refugees. We capitalized this philanthropic initiative last year with $30 million and we named it the West Miriam Asafa Fund. Miriam Asafa was my predecessor and Wes's CEO over 38 years. It was a privilege to name this initiative after her and we are well on our way to providing grants to organizations and also will announce uh, in, the, in the coming month our first two impact investments, all aimed at improving conditions and reducing barriers for immigrants and refugees. Next slide, please. This is where we're working through our global talent bridge, our social impact programs, and through our philanthropic initiatives. We are already in 32 states and in every province in Canada not only providing credential evaluation reports, but funding our own social impact programs. Our aim in the next five years as part of our strategic plan is to have a presence in every state in the United States, reducing the barriers for international students and immigrants. Next slide, please. So this is how we see ourselves. We are taking our uh, view of social enterprise for West to the next level. In the center, we have our core business providing credential evaluation reports and the revenues from that over the next five years are likely to grow to annual uh, revenue levels of about 150 mil million. We will use our reserves to fund social impact programs as the top of the slide. We will recapitalize the philanthropic initiative with additional resources in the next five years. And the other crucial part of what we do is socially responsible investing. And there, there lies our partnership with TIFF. And this is a crucial part of how we think about our revenues, our surpluses and reserves. Next slide, please. It's my last slide. And we are so proud to partner with TIFF. Uh, an amazing group of individuals and pr uh, investment professionals, leaders in the world that we respect so much. And uh, in October of 2018, we issued an RFP to which TIFF and several other firms responded. And we selected TIFF as our partner and our initial investment of 76 million was placed with TIFF and we started working closely with them. I came on board in 2019 and um, last summer started asking many questions. And Kevin and Chris and the CEO at that time and the new CEO with whom I'm also in conversations regularly, I started asking questions of, um, I understand there's an ESG lens to the investing, but tell me more. What does that mean? Is there a certification? of where our funds are being invested. Are we investing in funds and companies that have a, a good record on human rights? Are we avoiding companies that practice child labor? How do we do specifically in more detail on climate change, on renewable energy? Are we invested in private prisons? Are we invested in firearms? I wanted to know, and my organization of nearly 500 staff whose values are aligned with the mission of WES wanted to know. We began a conversation and that conversation, my colleague said, look, this, this can't change overnight, but let's engage in a conversation, which a year later resulted in the launch of um, a sustainable investment solution and we became a seed partner of that fund. 
and um, are thrilled to be partnered with our TIF colleagues and um, look forward to the conversation and look forward to making sure that our investments are aligned with the, the values of the organization. So thank you so much. Esther, that's terrific. I, I love hearing that story. I mean, it's remarkable the, the growth that you've experienced, but what you guys are doing with, with that growth um, and directing your efforts is really uh, commendable. And, and we have much respect as well for you and, and your leadership um, and all the good effort uh, that Wes is putting forward. Uh, and are delighted to be your partner in this. And as, as Esther noted, you know, it, there were questions as it related to how we were investing, uh, questions that we had we had thought about and been asked before, um, but we're thinking about it in new ways. Um, so to that end, I, I'm gonna invite Chris to, to share his remarks as it relates to that part of the journey um, and what, what questions we're asking ourselves today. Yeah, thanks. And thanks a lot, Esther. I learned a lot about Wes um, over the last couple of years, but I learned a lot there too. And I just want to make an initial point, which is Esther and Wes's efforts, it represents the beginning, the earliest part of a value chain. So the, the capital markets and the sustainable investment markets start with individual and institutional investors. So asset owners have mission, uh, mission-driven asset owners want to align investments with their, with their values. They ask questions of groups like TIFF. We ask questions of, of asset managers. Asset managers ask questions of corporations. And through this value chain, that's how we have impact. It all starts with institutional investors like Wes and like everyone on the phone today. So um, I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about change. And the reason we want to talk, make this, um, portion of the presentation about change is that that's what we think at TIFF sustainable investing is really about really what it comes down to it's environmental and social change and how businesses and investors are responding to that it's changes in technology business models consumer habits general awareness of environmental and social issues regulation reporting and transparency and we think that the path to having positive impact while meeting your risk and return goals is through understanding this change and the inherent risks and opportunities. And I happened to read um, a, a quarterly letter by an, a manager that I've been tracking. Um, and I, I just wanna give a quote from that letter, which, was, which is the winners of the future will be the companies that understand the change that have positioned themselves for the future and are return oriented. So that's what um, we're trying to target at TIFF and, and we hope to share some ideas about how others can do that as well. If we can have you take away anything from this, we, we would hope it would be the following. So change creates risk and opportunity, and there's a lot of both out there. Optimizing for financial, environmental, and social returns is complicated, but it can be done. And we hope to provide some practical ideas for how you all might, might do that. Before I start talking about the change we're seeing, I just wanna spend a few minutes, or you know, about a minute on our TIFF's sustainable investment history. So. We've been incorporating the G of ESG since inception in 91. There's two key pillars to our investment philosophy. We look for managers with uh, competitive advantages in their investment processes and strong alignment of interests between the manager and the investors and within an organization. That's largely a, an evaluation of the G. So that's been part of our process um, for 30 years. In 2014, we made our official foray into social responsible investing by launching a Catholic version of our investment solution. So we have about six or seven years experience managing a portfolio, a multi-asset class portfolio that has that employs a negative screen. In 2017, we integrated a ESG into our process in a more robust way. And that's what, um, Kevin and Esther both alluded to, it's, it's a core part of our manager selection process across asset classes, across TIF portfolios. And that's been happening since January, 2017. And then in July, with West's support, we launched our sustainability solutions, which take it all to the next level. Um, and why do we do that? It, the answer is change. We wanted a strategy that focuses on these opportunities. And so in talking about change, I wanted to start with an all encompassing issue that we're all familiar with because I think it's very important and highlights a lot of 
risk and opportunity out there. So it's, it's climate change. And on this slide, there's a quote from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was created by the UN in 1988 to perform um, scientific research on climate change. And what it says is stabilizing temperatures below two degrees relative to pre-industrial levels, which is the goal of the Paris Accord, will require urgent and fundamental departure from business as usual. That departure is happening right now. Um, businesses and are changing. Consumers' habits are changing. So a few different key ways it's happening. Climate mitigation. So in order to, um, to, to reduce the effects of climate change, we basically have to reduce emissions. So think things like renewable energy, energy efficiency technology, um, different changes in packaging, less use of plastics, which are made by fossil fuels. There's a, there are very large and involved value chains involved in the process of climate mitigation. A lot of opportunity there and a lot of risk to the businesses that do not, that are large emitters and do not respond to, the, to this change. Climate adaptation and transition refers to um, adapting to a warmer world. It involves things like understanding where your physical assets lie. Are they prone to storm and drought or sea level change? Think about farming and the number of people around the world that are dependent upon the land and those that are in areas prone to drought and storm. Think about insurance businesses and how they have to think and how they have to adjust to all this, banks and their exposure. There's a lot um, happening in the climate adaptation and transition fields as well. Big value chains being disrupted. And all of this has a disproportionate impact on the poor. They often live in lower elevation areas. They're often dependent on the land and they have less capital to adapt to a lot of this change. And so you'll see things like the EU Green Deal and other initiatives that are happening around the world to make sure that um, we're creating a more inclusive economy. And it um, has a lot to do with the very clear impact that all this has on the poor. So that's a consideration for businesses as, as they adapt to this environment. So can we move to the next slide, please? I'm doing a, mini, a little mini case study here on change. So in order to mitigate climate change and the, and the social issues associated with it, we have to make big changes to how we generate and consume electricity. So on the left of this, slide, you have the grid of today, the electric grid of today. You have utilities in the gray circles, sending electricity out to homes and other buildings and to some like the small amount of electric vehicles we have at this point. It's a one-way street, it's a centralized model with the utilities in the middle sending electricity out one way. This is changing dramatically as renewables become cheaper and more and used more, as battery technology gets cheaper, and as auto and home technologies adapt, we're getting to a point where, where the consumer, the consuming devices, electricity, including homes and cars, can also produce electricity. Or they can, uh, and they can send that electricity back out onto the grid. So this creates a two-way grid. It creates a, an environment where there are a number of devices that have to be synchronized in certain ways. So it, so it requires software changes to um, certain changes to the real estate, businesses and construction, of course, autos, utilities have to adapt to a two-way grid, microgrids. There's a great deal of change happening in how we consume and generate electricity. And so it's incumbent upon us as, as investors to, to understand this and to make sure our, our managers understand that and um, are seeing the risks and taking advantage of the opportunities. So that's kind of one little mini case study, but it involves lots of different value chains and, um, and very large addressable markets. So, but there's change everywhere. I mean, we're, we're seeing it in all sectors across the world, change to do with sustainability. So these colored boxes, many may recognize are represent four of the UN sustainable development goals, which were, generated by the UN in 2015. There are 17 goals geared to creating a more inclusive and sustainable world and economy. And so just a few examples of 
where we're elsewhere where we're seeing change in healthcare, there are businesses out there solving to reduce costs in the healthcare system, free orphan diseases, um, get access to underserved population. Businesses and technologies are, are trying to solve these issues. And those that do are gonna be the winners of the future. And those that don't will be left behind. Water infrastructure in the US and the Europe is in bad shape. It's in, it's in need of a lot of investment. It's in need of technological upgrade. So we have been looking at opportunities in that area. We talked about farming a bit and the idea that climate change is, is very um, critical to, to our agricultural and food system. There's a lot of change going on in sustainable consumer products and packaging. And this idea of a circular economy is very powerful where the output or the waste from one business can be the input to another. If you can build an economy where, the, where waste is an input, you're reducing a tremendous amount of waste and solving a lot of problems. And so there's a lot of good innovation happening there too. And businesses that are not adapting to that and are continuing to produce waste in a world where, the, where everyone's increasingly conscious of waste and its impacts are going to fall behind. So you have to be aware of all this change. And next slide, please. That, we haven't even gotten to the hard part yet. So social issues, how do you incorporate human rights, racial equity, diversity and inclusion into your investment strategies? Critical issues like the income gap, affordable housing, worker health and safety, education product. These are really hard issues. I'd say they are the hardest to implement into an investment strategy, but it, but it can be done. There's an increasing number of papers, research, um, data providers. Um, IEN has actually put out a piece on how to incorporate racial issues into your investment process. So there's, a, there's a lot of tools out there and um, ways to incorporate this. And we'll talk about a few of them on the next slide, please. So a ton of change out there. It's, it's, um, it's a little bit scary. It's also exciting. There's a lot of risk. You need to be aware of there's a lot of opportunity. So how do you incorporate this practical strategies for getting involved and in investing sustainably? So I, I, we break it down to four different kind of buckets here. I'll go through them each. So in investment strategies, this refers to, in the case of TIFF and a lot of institutional investors, your manager selection, what types of managers are you investing in? What are their strategies and how do they incorporate ESG? There's lots of different ways to approach this and it kind of how you do it depends on your goals and objectives. But the top um, category there, investment ESG integration. So these are managers that are integrating environmental, social and governance factors into their investment processes in a way that is material to their decisions, not a check the box exercise. There's a broad range of managers doing ESG integration from um, not very thoughtful to very, very thoughtful. So, um, you know, a lot of work goes into in kind of figuring out what are the best ESG integration strategies and aligning with those managers. ESG engagement takes that a step further. It's managers that are identifying gaps in ESG practices at corporations and then engaging with those corporations to help improve those practices thereby improving the ESG profiles of the companies and the investment value. Thematic investing refers to investing in managers that are, um, that are focused on sustainability themes, such as water. We talked about water infrastructure needing the upgrade. There are managers out there and TIFF has a relationship with one, investing exclusively in the water sector. Healthcare, the energy transition, investing dollars behind these themes as a way to have positive impact with your investment dollars. And there's a, there's a lot of managers out there an increasing number specializing in sustainability themes. Negative screen. So Esther talked about um, Wes's um, interest in, in not owning certain types of stocks. Negative screens are a very effective way to align your values with your investments. If you don't want to earn certain things, you don't own them. And there's a really good economic argument and social argument for not owning certain businesses like civilian firearms, and coal and private prisons. And so that's a very effective tool that TIFF uses and that others can use. Impact investing is a term that's used in a lot of different ways. To us, it means 
we use it as more targeted private investments into specific um, populations or causes. And that's, and there's an increasing number of, of funds out there that are specializing in, in particular areas. And it's a really good way to align investments with values as well. Community developed financial, development financial institutions are private local financial institutions that um, were designed out of the Community Reinvestment Act of 1977, and they are designed to loan money to um, businesses and nonprofits and affordable housing in underserved communities. And they exist all over the country, so you can kind of develop relationships with those that are in your local areas and deploy capital. And then that capital is, there, is in turn deployed into those communities. So that's your investments. That's a, that's a huge part of what TIFF does and I think what we all think about as institutional investors. But there's also a lot more we can do. So policies and practices, the top right box. There's lots of things that we can um, incorporate to have further impact outside of just choosing investment strategies. One is engaging with our managers, helping them get smarter on these issues, the issues that matter to us and just what's going on in the world. We do this all the time at TIFF. We help, we provide tools to our managers about how they can get better on engaging with corporates um, and they help us get smarter too. And so engaging with, with managers is a really important tool, helping them get smarter help, and then helping us get smarter. Stakeholder engagement. There are lots of ways for limited partners and shareholders to use our voices outside of you know, just deploying our capital. Um, IEN has opportunities on their website to sign on to investor letters or get involved in, in, in investor working groups around particular issues um, and you know, getting involved, using your voice, sending out letters to corporations at times or regulators about issues that, that matter to us as institutional investors. The UNPRI also has a very robust, what they call their collaboration platform for that type of activity. Diversity and inclusion, incorporating it into your own organization. We're spending a lot more time on that at TIFF and it's empowering and it's, and it's flowing through into our investment processes as well, setting um, goals and targets for the diversity and inclusion within our organizations and within our portfolios. And all of this can be incorporated into investment policy statements. IEN has great tools um, for IPSs as well on their website, including how and including some case studies on how investors incorporate ESG into their investment policy statements. And then um, tools and resources. So there's a lot of ways to evaluate individual investments on ESG um, categories, data and scoring. They have their, there's lots of them. They have all of their pros and cons. You can get individual company data and roll it up into your portfolio. So there's reporting and analysis tools out there. And then we also think it's good to understand the ESG and impact investing frameworks, groups like SASB, I mentioned earlier, the, earlier the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, GRI, the PCFP, the Task Force for um, climate related financial disclosures. These are groups that are trying to standardize the reporting of corporate non financial or ESG information, and they're making a lot of progress. And then industry groups like Ceres, which is focused on climate change and produces a lot of great content and offers opportunities to get involved. And then lastly, um, we just think it's important to do our own research. So if, if we have um, views that climate change matters, we try to do our own. Uh, research on climate change and just read read the reports, read the academic literature um, on the energy transition on water, just to be smarter on this on these issues so that we can challenge our managers and the, and, and help them get smarter and um, and just networking, speaking with people of from all different types of institutions and all walks of life and perspectives, because as I think we all know, this concept of sustainability, you know, there's a lot of commonality to it and there's a lot of different opinions and perspectives as well all of which are very valuable and so um, just getting out and talking to folks has been great very valuable for TIFF and um, no we uh, would love to network with anybody else on the phone on, on the webinar today so hopefully give you a sense of everything that's going on you know we're working really hard to understand it we think others should too because it's really important to our investment strategies and hopefully we provided some uh, practical ideas 
for how to get involved. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was terrific. Um, learned a lot there and certainly a lot to, uh, to chew on. Um, we do have a couple of questions. We've got less than 10 minutes left, so I'll, I'll just kind of go immediately into that if it's, uh, and I guess the Q&A box is still open, so if folks have questions, please feel free to make use of that. Uh, the first one is with regards to the, the term social enterprise. I, I love this concept, so uh, I'm gonna direct this to Esther. Um, describe, you describe Wes as a social enterprise. Is this a growing trend in the nonprofit sector and, and what are the factors driving this trend? Absolutely. So um, uh, I, I think overall there, we all know that there is a growing trend and focus on building an inclusive economy and um, on advancing the idea of shared prosperity. I think that is uh, a theme that is uh, growing um, and I'm glad it's a growing trend. Um, and that's a growing trend across nonprofits, across government, um, and uh, of course, um, the private sector. Um, I had a chance to be a part of um, Laureate um, Education uh, becoming the world's largest B Corp. So I got to see the growing trend among um, uh, the private sector, among the business sector as well. And um, we uh, at Laureate at that time became the largest um, B Corp and became the first public benefit corporation to IPO on any stock exchange in the world when we went public um, on NASDAQ. So I saw this trend among businesses and now I'm seeing um, the growing trend in the nonprofit sector. And um, this is um, a driven by the fact that uh, um, less than 97% uh, 97 of nonprofits operate um, on less than 5 million a year and less than uh, 80 or 88% of nonprofits operate on less than 1 million a year. So most nonprofits are small. 50% of nonprofits in the United States have less than one month of reserves. So the resource needs of nonprofits is significant. And when you are a donor driven and donor dependent nonprofit organization, um, uh, you can't quite advance the mission of your organization in the way you can when you have your own unrestricted resources. Wes having a business that serves its target community and generates um, with, through a modest fee generates revenues and now surpluses has given us um, an incredible amount of flexibility to advance our mission through um, by funding social impact programs, by funding our own philanthropy, and now by investing responsibly and protecting the long-term sustainability of, uh, of Wes and uh, the people we serve. I certainly hope that this is gonna be a growing trend, uh, seeing more social enterprises in the nonprofit sector um, able to have their own resources that are not donor directed um, and uh, can be leveraged for further advancing the mission of the organization. We hope at West to become an example for how this can work going forward. And it's very much a part of our uh, strategic plan over the next five years to share our model and uh, experience. I think um, I think the world would be a better place if there were more social enterprises uh, coming about and, and hopefully replicating the model that, that Wes has set out. So, so thank you for that. Um, the next question is regards to communicating sustainability efforts, or maybe that's can be interpreted as reporting. How do you communicate sustainability efforts within an organization as well as to those outside? And maybe Chris, I, I, I don't know, if I think of your last slide or one of your last slides about tools and resources, um, maybe that comes into play. Sure. So I think there's a couple things here. There's the reporting of kind of ESG information and, and the communicating of sustainability efforts within the organization. I'll, I'll take the first one. So communicating sustainability efforts within the organization. It, it, it starts at the top. So it's the tone from the top that's critical. Uh, Dick Flannery, our current chairman and, and, and CEO for 17 years, and now Kane Brennan, who's our current CEO, are very big proponents of 
sustainable investing and diversity and inclusion. And it's not just about our investments, it's about living it. So that communicating that from the top is critical. Uh, we have an ESG committee, which is very helpful. So it meets monthly. It, um, it includes people from all over our organization. So not just investments, but finance and operations and outreach yourself, Kevin. Um, so that's a great way for us to, to get together and talk about the key issues that, that TIFF wants to tackle in, in sustainable investing and also within our organization. Um, we talk about these issues at our board meetings and we have and occasionally at our monthly staff updates. So there's a lot of ways to, that we communicate internally. In terms of ESG kind of reporting and data, uh, there's also a lot of ways to do that. You know, there's, we talked about the tools and resources for ESG kind of scoring on the company level and rolling up to the portfolio level. Um, so there's lots of people out there doing that, MSCI, Sustainalytics, other kind of differentiated groups like True Value Labs and Rep Risk. Um, some of our managers and a lot of managers out there in increasing number also produce their own kind of ESG reports so you can use those. And then you can also ask your managers for information on different things, like for example, their own diversity internally or and how they evaluate those things at with their own portfolio company. So those are a few ways we think about communication. Thanks, Chris. I, I know we're running out of time. I'm gonna try and do this, this last one uh, quickly. This is again, back to Esther. Um, what percent of, of what you'd consider your endowment is mission aligned? Do you see any reasons for that number not to be 100% eventually, if not already? I would say 100% of our resources are mission aligned. We are a nonprofit by incorporation. And by virtue of that fact, all of our resources, all of our revenues, surpluses have to be mission aligned. We reinvest our uh, uh, um, reserves, our surpluses into our social impact programs, into our philanthropic activities and, um, and, and through uh, responsible investing. Um, all of it is mission aligned and aligned with three of the values that our staff picked as uh, the most important for our organization. And those were values around opportunity, around inclusion, and around equity. So 100% mission aligned and values aligned. That's awesome. Thank you for that, Esther. I'm going to turn it back now to Allison IEN. Uh, thank, every, thank you to everybody who has joined. Uh, we really appreciate your time and hopefully you learned something today. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar.